Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Rasika. I wanted to chat real quick about how we're going to be releasing this podcast. And since both Drew Paul Bell and myself have pretty active YouTube channels, what we've decided to do is to split it up. So on the Young Architect YouTube channel, I'm going to post all of the episodes that are even numbered. So, you know, episode zero, episode two, four, you know, I'm gonna post all the even numbered episodes and Drew Paul Bell's gonna take all the odd numbered episodes and post them on his channel. And so to make it easy, so you're not bouncing back and forth all these different episodes, uh, I would first say both subscribe to both the Young Architect and the Drew Paul Bell YouTube channels. But what both of us are gonna do is we've created a playlist on each of our YouTube channels called the Mike and Drew Architecture Podcast. And in that playlist, it's got all the episodes listed. And even though Drew Paul Bell, I don't know, posted episode three on his channel, I can still add that to the playlist and have it sequential. And to make it even easier, I've created links, two links. I have youngarchitect.com slash Mike, which will take you to the playlist on Young Architect channel and youngarchitect.com slash Drew, which will take you to the same playlist on Drew's channel. In some ways, it doesn't even matter whose playlist you're watching because they're the same exact videos. And so that's how we're going to do it is, you know, Young Architect will post the even, Drew's got the odd numbers. And then in a couple of weeks down the road, after we get this playlist, kind of, this, this podcast kind of roll it out a little bit faster, uh, we're going to strip the audio. We're just going to take the audio from all these and we're going to actually put it out as a podcast the same way we publish the Young Architect podcast. We'll post it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. We'll get it out there. But for now, we're just releasing these on YouTube. So, so that's how we're doing it. And I hope you enjoy the new show. Take care, everyone. And we're back. Me and Drew. How you doing, Drew? It's been a couple I'm weeks. I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? It's been a busy few weeks. I know. I think it's what it's been like three weeks or like three or four weeks since we've last done a podcast. You know, I hadn't thought about it, but I think you're right. Yeah, I got what ended up. Okay, so what had happened was I just got super busy with the summer series, and it was like every day it was just like I was I was working on my I was working on my talks. I was organizing things. We we're you know getting ready for this event, and I was like Drew, I, we just got I just gotta we just gotta put this thing on hold for a minute. Um, and then the summer series happened, and um, yeah, which was great, by the way. Yeah, I want to hear what, Drew, I'm real interested to hear what you think of the summer series. Maybe we'll just dive right into that. Um, what'd you think, Drew? It was cool, man. I feel like, all right, so when, you, when you're dealing with something like that, it kind of depends largely on the group. Well, sorry, I think that matters whether you're doing it online or whether you're doing it in person, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of like the vibe of the, of all the attendees. And that's what was so, that's, I think that was the biggest benefit of the of the conference in Portland, Oregon, which was that like everybody there had an amazing attitude. A lot of them knew each other already, or it's yeah. just because like you said that vibe, but like the, the yeah. venue was actually cool instead of some boring conference center. And um, everybody was kind of on the same page and they were all there ready to party, whether that meant partying for real or like focused on, the keynotes and on the and on the workshops and whatever um but i feel like that same energy they brought that same energy to the online conference and i was a little nervous because i felt like when, once you even once we got in there it's kind of weird like oh I like this oh, I like this digital thing but you know like we had the comment section going in the chat yeah. and things were going really well i loved the i love like the networking event oh yeah things that we had With marley yeah because she'd kind of like, she brought this, they'd break up into like these small groups and everybody was talking about what, um, you know, prompts. And it was a great way to handle the difficult situation of having a conference online. Yeah. I feel like it, it satisfied all of the, all of the challenges in doing that. You know, then on top of that, you had, a little bit different dynamic where you had the actual lectures and I noticed how you know normally if you go to a conference they got like the keynote address and then they got three or they got other time slots and then you got to pick one or the other if you're, what you're going to do but then the way that you structured it I thought was interesting because it's like there was only ever one thing at a time going on mm -hmm. 
but the idea is that it's going to be recorded. If you want to skip something, you know, you just, you, like for, I, I didn't sit in on the ARE, the ARE lectures because I've already passed the ARES and yeah. I had work I was trying to get done at the office working from home. It allowed a kind of flexibility to it. Like it, obviously the first online conference I've ever attended, but also the best online conference I've ever attended. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. It, it, it's an impressive feat to pull off. Yeah. I know it was scary, <laughs> but in, in some, in a weird way. And I talked about this on one in my keynote on the last day was, um, you know, it was actually my coach, Danielle. She said to me, she said, if anyone can pull off an online conference, it's you because you already have this, like you've already accomplished the impossible, which is, uh, creating online, creating an ARE study group, which is impossible, yet doing it digitally with people across America and having it be, self, you know, like completely self-sustaining and working with the ARE bootcamp. She's like, you've already accomplished that. You're already using the technology. You already have the Young Architect Academy platform where uh, we can host all of the, the videos and all of the information that already exists. That's that creating that, if you didn't already have it, would have been a huge uh, burden, but it already existed. We already had the, the, the space for all that. And, uh, like the infrastructure. Know, yeah. And we already had, uh, an audience, you know, we were going to, we were going to do a conference this summer anyways, during the same time, we already have the audience, we already have the people, we already have the connections to the speakers and the workshops. We already have the zoom accounts. We are, I've been doing webinars since COVID happened. Like we are like, there were so many pieces that I felt like were working in our favor. The scary thing, though, was we've never done this before, and that was just what terrified me. <laughs> but yeah, I was—I um, think it was a huge success, man. I also love how, like, we can go back and watch the recordings. Yeah, it's still there. Because you know, there, there was an argument in architecture that I always thought was really cool. It was like, you know, you should do something with one material that you can't do with some other material. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's something about truth and Mies van der Rohe and John Ruskin and all that. And they were talking about, you know, it's like you shouldn't build copies in wood. You shouldn't build copies in, in metal or copies in steel of copies in stone of copies of wood. And um, I think that's cool. I think the idea that you have this new material, you say, hey, what can this do that we couldn't do in the past? And then you do that rather than new copies of the old thing. Yeah. And to me, I feel like you did exactly the same. You took that, you took that concept exactly. And you were like, okay, well, we got this digital conference. It doesn't make sense to have multiple things at the same time because that's kind of overload. Let's have, you know, this whole track where, you know, you're doing one, one thing at a time. You're not missing out on anything and they're all recorded. You know, yeah. you have to step away. It's already recorded. You can come back and check it out later. The value of watching it live is you get to par partake in the chat and really feel like you're part of the moment of the event. But if for whatever reason you're unable to do that, it allows you flexibility, that's an added value, and then you can go back and watch them later on. And that's something that's hard to do with an in-person conference because you got to record each thing, you got to get mm -hmm. the audio just right. There's so yep. many things. It's oh, yeah. Yeah, so many. It is. It also allowed us, you know, to have, I think we had three times the amount of programming at the summer series than we had at the 2019 Young Architect Conference. Really? Because, yes, because we're not locked into digital space. There was only so many rooms and so many spaces we could go to and things were happening at the same time. But um, yeah, I think because we, we, you know, summer series was five days, the Architect Conference was three days. And uh, there was a lot of long breaks in between the events. Well, yes, we did have, you know, three things happening all at the same time. Um, I, I, we still got, I feel like we still got to have as much programming without, and at the same time, like the ticket prices, you know, I think we sold the, the final price was $199 for the summer series ticket. I had, we were looking through the, the, the feedback forms of what people told us. There were like multiple people who were like, I have spent well over a thousand dollars attending a national architecture conference and I did not get nearly half of what I got out of the summer series out of it. So I believe that man. Yeah, I believe that. So, but the good news drew coming out of all this, 
we're going to do a conference every six months. So we're going to do the winter series in January. We announced that. And then in July, we're going to do either a young architect conference or another summer series. We got to see what's happening with the pandemic. Uh, but either way, we're going to have a conference. We're going to have one in January, another one in, in, in the summertime. And that gets me excited because I feel like there's so much that goes into each one of these. It's like we work so hard and then it's okay. Foot off the gas. We go back to, we go, you know, we, we go up to 125 miles an hour and then boom back down to 20 miles an hour. And then it's waiting. Wait, wait. I felt like the, the weight is the worst part of this. If we could just roll right into the next one and get ready for it, start working on that. I have something to look at, not feeling like I got to let all this time pass. So wait, yeah. why do you say that? Why would you rather get it done now than wait? Uh, I'd rather do another event because I think it, uh, the energy, there's a lot of people that are really excited. Yeah. Um, I want to like I, today I was, I went out a run this morning and I started mapping out mentally, uh, what my next workshop's going to be, um, and kind of defining what that looks like. And, um, you know, I can't, I mean, I, I can't do speaking events because of the pandemic. So, fuck it, let's put all our resources and let's create our own conference and, and our own events. So yeah, I'm just excited to, to, to do the next one. If this, if the pandemic wasn't happening, I, I would be traveling. I'd be somewhere in the middle of America, kind of driving around, giving lectures, but um, let's do this instead. And I think in the long run, I think we're gonna have a better product, which is the goal, so. What about a weekly series? Like yeah. every week, almost like a lunch and learn, but one that isn't lame. Yeah, it could. One of the things Yamalan. Well, I guess it's the podcast that you do. Yeah, it's the boot camp I do as well, which is like. The boot camp too, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just throwing it out there. But uh, what Yamalan brought up, he said, uh, you know, he's, he's like, he said, he kind of said the same thing. He's like, I hate the wait. I hate waiting for the, like, between years for like a whole, almost a whole year for the next event. He's like, I want to do like a meetup once a month and bring, let's, let's all come back together and let's have a party and let's talk about, I'll, you know, I'll give, he's like, we'll all get, someone will give a presentation about something for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, we'll have a party. We'll all get together and just have, you know, and let's like keep this energy. Let's just keep this thing going. Maybe once, you know, once a month, let's meet up. And I said, I love this idea. And you know, Chad, did you watch, Drew, did you ever watch the Young Arctic conference videos where, with the, vi with the days where Chad made a whole, vi he made like a 10 to 12 minute video for each day oh, yeah. with a little bit of everything that happened during that day. Um, he's going to do the same thing with the summer series. He's actually, we, I met with him yesterday. He's he, to kind of kick off that project. Um, and then we were thinking when Yamalan has that, those parties once a month, we'll have a new video and we'll do like a premiere of the Chad's latest video and show it to everyone before it Very goes out cool. to the public. So. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun. Drew, did you have a favorite part of the summer series? Favorite part. Um, so, all right. I liked the one where he was talking about Excel. Oh yeah. Tony. I came into that one late because I was busy with something else. And um, I feel like to really get the full experience, I got to like sit down with the sample files and like play around with it. But I thought that was super valuable. Then there was another one talking about the entrepreneurship, um, like how to start the side business. And I felt like oh, my that house? content, yeah, that content was really good. Um, those are two highlights for me. The, 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 the Excel one wasn't so much fun as it was. It's like, dude, I really should know this. Yeah. And like, this is super powerful. <laughs> and it, it, some people usually, whenever somebody's like, Oh, my favorite lecture was X, Y, Z. It's usually the one that's the most motivating. Yeah. Um, the Excel thing wasn't super motivating. It was more about like, I recognized in my own office that we use Excel a lot with programming and stuff like that. And I can tell that we got these old principals who are just dominant at Excel and that's because they're out here doing budgets all day and that's what mm -hmm. makes the money. So, um, so I know that there's a lot of value in using Excel. I think that if you learn Excel, you know, you, we talk about learning Archicad or Revit or whatever kind of architecture software there is, but like, if you know Excel, you know how to 
do spreadsheets, you can make business plans, you can make a ton of money. It's, it's arguable. It's arguable about which, which program is more valuable to your professional, to your profession, Excel or, you know, your architecture programs. So to me, that was one of the highlights. Good. I love it. That was, those are great workshops, both of them. Yeah. I'm glad it's over. <laughs> It was the favorite part of the ever series was when it's over. No, it was, it was an amazing five days. It was a lot. It was, and actually even the last day, the Sunday to Monday night, I didn't even go to sleep. I was just, um, Chad, I was helping Chad with the video and then I started watching the interviews and then I was getting ready for my keynote in the morning. And then I was just, I was so, I was so wound up from all the activity that had happened that had been going on. I was just like, fuck it. And I just went through, I just did, I pulled, I went architecture school style and I just worked right through the night. I felt great in the morning. And then you didn't be, sleep at all. I didn't sleep at sleep all, at man. Five? I didn't sleep at all. I just went okay. straight, straight through watching Gross. videos, getting ready for the, my presentation, doing dial in and tighten up my, my, my talk. And then what, like an hour before the talk, my keynote, the fire alarms start going off my apartment and, the was, fire alarm they, yeah they decided that they were going to test the fire alarms um the day the 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 an hour before i was going to do my keynote talk at this conference i've been planning for a year um Perfect. yeah so i ended up going i just grabbed all my equipment and i went to the van and so i did my keynote out of the sprinter van <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah it was wild Murphy's yeah. law, huh? Yep, that's how it goes. But I'm I'm glad to be back, Drew. I missed you, man. It's been a couple of weeks. I want to get back into our regular I podcast. Man, I miss you too. Our our Tuesday, our Taco Tuesdays. I actually had tacos today. Oh yeah. Yeah, I did. Today's Wednesday, though. I know, but <laughs> I had tacos anyway. I had tacos yesterday on Tuesday. Legit. Yeah, that hasn't stopped. <laughs> but yeah, we got to keep it going, man. What else is going on with Drew? Any, any big news over the past couple of weeks? Yeah, okay. So I saw this article. Um, there's this report that I found from McKinsey. And McKinsey, if you're not familiar with the business world, it sounds like big wig, mm. business mm. consulting, marketing firm. I think Mitt Romney was one of the presidents at one point. Yeah. Like This is like one of the most elite business consulting things to get into they do reports about all business and all kinds of things they were one of they're also one of the people who are doing reports about covid19 and all that i was google i was googling some random topic and i found this article from arc arc daily huh? from a few years back and i remember seeing it at the time but you know in it anyway so he links out to this mckinsey article and they're saying in this article these are these are business professionals man and they are saying that the architecture construction industry is like one of the least efficient industries in the economy. And, you know, first of all, within the world of architecture, I think that too many architects are guilty of like the siloing effect. Okay. Like I saw this when I was in college, I got a minor in business administration. There were four or five of us in, any of these business classes I was taking and all the other, all my fellow architecture classmates were sitting in these business classes and they were not talking to anyone else. They all sit next to each other. They all talk with each other. They're joking about what happened in studio the other day. It's like, Hey, we got other people here. We can make friends with the business majors. I'm tired of you people, you know, joking around, but like I hang out with you guys enough. Like we can, you know, make friends outside of the business, outside of the architecture department for once. Why are you just insulated and only talking to yourselves? You know, then we look at, all right, what's happening in architecture? And we're like, oh, well, we got all these problems. We don't, we don't make enough money, X, Y, Z. Well, it's like, then you look at someone like Bjork Ingalls and Bjork Ingalls Group hired a business. Oh, you know what? I think that woman, Sheila, worked at McKinsey, if I remember correctly. The CFO, who is now the CEO of BIG, I think worked at McKinsey. And she now is a CEO of Bjork Ingalls Group. And she delivered the keynote address at the AIA event in New York. And she was talking about the business of architecture. Mm -hmm. She, she well, comes right. in here and she's like, yeah. well, we came in here and we insist on being paid. And I think it's ridiculous that you architects don't insist on getting paid. And 
and she said that she came into she came into Bjork and Hill's group and that they didn't even they don't know how many employees they had before she got there because there wasn't good records <laughs> like they think it was about 15 and they don't really know what happened before then um and you know so I'm, I'm a big believer in this first of all cross-disciplinary information right you can't get become too insular and too insular we can even sit here and you know and um, architects are likely to do that. America is likely to do that too. You know, we can sit around talking about the risk of like two party systems versus whatever. There's other countries who have done multiple party systems. You know, there's plenty of things that we're talking about here. We're like, Oh, well, I don't know. There's other countries who have done it. So you got to look to what's been done around you in other sectors, other countries, other locations. Um, this McKinsey report is written by people who know they're not architects. They're not stuck in like this, in this, in this jar of this, in this, they're not stuck in this water, mm -hmm. unaware of what's going on, unaware of other, of other practices. They are very aware of these other practices. So then they come up here and then they talk about how inefficient we are, how unproductive we are. And now I've been scanning through the document. I've not read the whole thing, but I want to bring this up because I think it's important that people, anyone knows it's there, first of all, that these architecture, the architects who are following this know it's there, know to go look for it. And um, we can maybe include a link. But one of the topics that they talk about is the notion of uh, production and efficiency. They use the word bespoke. Okay. They say, oh, well, you know, the problem is like there's a bunch of bespoke projects. And to me, I feel like there's kind of this interesting balance here, right? They compare architecture in, in many places to manufacturing. Okay. At a, they look at it like at a GDP kind of level. Yeah. So you look at the efficiency in manufacturing today versus, I don't know, two decades ago, six decades ago, and efficiency has skyrocketed. I think they said that the um, something's been going up by like I think three point six percent. You know, I think that's general productivity is raising by 3.6%. And I forget mm -hmm. if that's across the entire market, like all these different markets, or if that was the U S economy or the global economy or what, but like in general, they said that like the average or something is like 3.6%. And we're much lower than that. We're like one, I don't want to say some numbers because I don't remember numbers very well, but like one in the ones degree. And so, um, so, so, so part of the criticism is that they're like, well, could we manufacture buildings better? Mm -hmm. And I feel torn about that topic specifically. And there, there's a lot, there's lots of topics. This is like a hundred, a hundred page report over hundred pages. But um, I feel like within architecture, I, I don't, I don't want to sit here and defend something that's not optimized. I think that we should definitely progress. Um, however, I, I, I look at what's going on with architecture and I do think that designing architecture is very different than designing cars because mm -hmm. yeah everyone drives the same toyota like when i say i a toyota camry you know what i mean maybe this one has extra cup holders or it's got mm -hmm. pockets in the back seat or maybe it's a v6 engine or versus a v4 or a four cylinder yeah but in general they're all they may be all driving the same cars but they're not all living in the same houses but then i wonder well do we need to all live it like nobody cares that their cars are all the same and nobody cares if they have the same Jordans. Nobody cares that they're listening to the same songs. Yeah. And it, and it seems like they don't really care that they're all living in the same houses because these cookie cutter McMansion developments are indeed selling. We can sit back and we can say, well, that's stupid because we're architects and we have our nose in the air. But I don't know. Yeah. I think that well-designed projects are better than like the cookie cutter McMansions. But maybe I've been trained to think that. Yeah, I don't think it's always housing, though. I mean, um, all of my, all of the projects I worked on, it was solving a problem. There's a there's a unique site. There's a unique problem that needs to be solved, and the architect we need a design. We need to build something to solve the problem. Um, yeah, that's right, and that's a bias that I keep finding myself having because within my first office, I was working on houses, and my office now we're working on corporate environments and. Through reading this report, I realized too that 
they they very clearly make the distinction by all means make no mistake this is my confusion not the mm -hmm. report the report i think was very good on this they talk about there there seems to be two worlds it's it says it's like a tale of two worlds or tale of two cities or tale of two industries mm -hmm. there's the large mega project at least large project um companies and then there's the small project companies and they break this down like subcontractors are small projects um there's uh there's contractors and architects and all kinds of people who are doing minor little things maybe that's modifications to a to a building small one-off projects could also they also include single family residential in that category and then in the other category the larger category they got mega projects they got public works projects high rises civic projects you know whatever and so i find myself too often thinking about houses yeah when i'm reading this report but in reality it's, it's everything now I, do, I don't think i want to see mass produced skyscrapers i don't think i want to see budget skyscrapers to be honest yeah and here's another thing that's crossed my mind it took it took 300 years to build some of these gothic cathedrals the the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona yeah. is still under construction. And nobody's going to look at that and say it's ugly. Well, maybe some people will look at it and say it's ugly. But people, there's a huge amount of people who travel all the way across the world to go see it. And so there's obviously a value in that. It's bespoke. I don't want to see 16 copies of the, part mm -hmm. of the Sagrada Familia. That would be cheap. You know, if I saw it showing up in Chattanooga, Tennessee... I'm not going to go travel down in Chattanooga, Tennessee to see that. <laughs> to see that. In t somewhere in Tennessee, they have a copy of the Parthenon. Oh, they do? I don't know if you knew this. Yeah, they have an exact replica of the Parthenon somewhere in Tennessee. I forget where. Um, fun fact. Hmm. But if there were copies of the Parthenon everywhere, I don't want to go see copies. I want to go see the real thing. Yeah. In Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't need to go see the mini version. What do you think about this, Matt? What do you think about mass producing buildings, man? Because that's been a topic that's come up and that we learned about in our history class. And I'm, yeah. not, I'm not so sure about it. Uh, I think it depends on what the building is. You know, uh, I did, I worked on a bunch of industrial buildings where it was, you know, those butler buildings. Where in some ways, we just laid out the dimensions and the engineer and we drew it up and boom it arrived um and explain then, to me what a butler building is because i should know what that is but i don't it's uh it's a truss that kind of meets in the middle yeah it's a tr it's a truss metal frame building that they um you know they pour a foundation with the anchor bolts and they come in and they put the trusses up and it's just kind of like a like a hanger it, 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 which is where like they got the metal columns going up yeah, the side and then they an arch them. yeah they're like the i-beam kind of columns that come gotcha, to like gotcha. make an arch and then you right. put a shell on on it um you We're know usually corrugated metal right yeah and and so i, I did a project where we, we in some ways it, it was a prefab building that showed up and we built a building around it and uh made that work um and it was efficient it was cheap and it, and it served its purpose. Um, I think, yeah, I think um, at the same time, there's always gonna be a market for people who want custom shit, high-end custom shit. And I think the nature, kind of what we were talking about earlier is there's always gonna be a problem to solve and a unique site that to work with. And I think there's always gonna be some kind of customization element to it. But, um, you know, mass producing, I think it has its place. Um, it has its place in the industry the same way custom, fancy, expensive, you know, build with sticks will always have its place, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I feel torn in different directions because uh, one thing that comes to mind is like Soviet block housing. Yeah. And that looks miserable. And then, but something else that comes to mind is this project called the Gables House in New York, in Atlanta. This was all made out of like prefabricated, I want to say SIP panels, but here's it. That's image. cool. So I think what they, if I understand this correctly, what they did was they basically like poured the foundation. They manufactured all of these panels in a shop. Um, 
off site, prefabricated, brought them on site, and then put them all together in a very short period of time. I forget if it was a, a matter of days or a week, but I think this is a pretty cool little project. And the, the more traditional among us would dislike it, but I saw another image not too long ago that talked about, you know, it showed a, an image of a car from several years, from like the 1960s compared to a car today. And mm -hmm. the difference is huge. But you look at the difference between the Bauhaus mm -hmm. and a typical apartment building today. And the difference is not significant, not, not much of a difference. So like, how is architecture changing? How does architecture change? Does it be, does this become, begin to become more common? Yeah. Here it is being assembled. Look at this. Yeah. My sister bought a house um, that uh, it was a brand new house. It got shipped. They, they poured the foundation and it got shipped in like five or six different trucks. They, a crane dropped all the different boxes into location and they kind of tied the whole thing together and put a roof on it. How did it yeah. come in trucks? It was uh it was pre-built somewhere else in a factory somewhere and they shipped it to her site and it was like um three or four different you know flatbeds with uh you know uh boxes and that they pulled off the trucks dropped them onto the foundation and um built essentially the skeleton of her house and then they did all the interior work after that cool have you ever seen the book called the, Ca the case study houses no. This book I've seen, all right, it was in my office back in Atlanta. I've seen it floating around all kinds of places. And this book document, all right, so there were, I think, it, I think it was organized by some kind of writer for an architecture magazine or newspaper article, architecture critic. Um, he pulled together all, some of the greatest architects of the, I want to say the 60s. Because people like the Eames, and I think Neutra and uh, I forget who else, but he basically had them do case study houses. The idea was that this was a case study. How could you design a house that could be mass producible? They were designed on modules, grids, and the idea was that it was done, um, you know, a lot of steel, let, let's say I beams and stuff to kind of build the structure and then infill panels that might be colorful plastic or glass or gypsum board or whatever. And the idea was that, you know, some of these might be able to be mass produced. They were designed, I think nearly all of them were in Los Angeles and they were kind of designed for that climate, I believe. But it's crazy to me that, you know, it was always my understanding that the idea behind it was that it could be mass produced, but then they, I don't think they were mass produced because I, I never saw any yeah. in the Southeast and maybe that's because they were designed for California, but I don't, I also don't know hmm. about them really floating around California. I, I think I did hear of Neutra building or no, it wasn't Neutra. There was some yeah. architect who I heard his, I heard his, his designs kind of had little outcroppings everywhere. This sounds familiar now that you're talking about it. I remember learning about this at school. I'm about to order the book, but it's this big old book and I'm trying to figure out which version I'm supposed to get, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I also feel like, you know, all right, let's say we as architects, you know, we have to design a building based on a bunch of parameters and that can be stuff that we figure out talking to a client, what's your program, what do you want, what do you need? You know, let's just say we add in one more parameter, which is, Hey, this could be reproduced easily. That doesn't seem so much more different than what we're already doing. You know who I had, I recorded a really great podcast uh, about a similar idea. It was with Ilya Azarov. Do you know that guy? You no, I'm him? not familiar. Okay. He lives in Brooklyn and um, he's an architect. He's very active with the AIA on a national level. And uh, he did a lot of Hurricane Sandy uh, reconstruction and he ended up designing a very sustainable um you know, resilient, hurricane resilient, you know, for the coast of Long Island and um, almost as a prototype. 
and he did this house project and in some ways he kind of made it open source and he gave it away and he said you know like here's this prototype you know we can use it you can use it somewhere else it could be adjusted you know another architect could take it and twist it and uh adjust it accordingly and uh yeah we did a really great it was like a year and a half ago but it was the Ilya azarov podcast where he talked about kind of creating kind of an open source house that you know could be used in a um built, built within a um what was it the hurricane with the floodplain like what was it long beach long island but yeah i love that idea the open source thing and there was this came up actually in another podcast as well i had farah um Sustainable Farah was on the podcast and she was talking about the solar decathlon. Did you guys ever do that in architecture school? We never did it, but we studied it a lot. Yeah. That's such a great, that was such a great design competition with, um, you know, a modular house was like 500 square feet, uh, completely off the grid, hundred percent self-sustaining and it had to be movable and set up on the, the Washington mall. But yeah. And so what, did she do that? She was a big part of it for a long time. She went to City University and um, they, um, yeah, they worked really hard on it. And when I was at NYIT, we were also competing with it as well. And uh, the students would actually build the freaking building and, and bring it down there. It was, a, it was a great project. I participated in the design competition. Um, after that, when the time came to actually do the work and build the building, I wasn't interested. But um, yeah, it was... I think, but overall, though, I mean, it was just a fantastic project about nice. kind of thinking modular and design and sustainability and kind of combining all these topics. Dude, right now, I would love to build something like that. Like, I'd love to partake in a, in a team like that. Um, yeah. But I also know that I would be just like you in college. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be doing, dealing with that shit because um, it's funny because I feel like in school, I right, I think you need to know that stuff, how the building actually goes together and you gain an amazing experience for doing that. But that does not add any more to your grades. And I think this might have been this might have been a weakness of mine. I was too so worried about the grades that, you know, I was focused on what I had to do to, to do well in studio. And if I was gonna spend all these hours sinking all these hours into this other project and then I didn't do well in the studio project. I wasn't willing to make that sacrifice. But, you know, I also look back at one summer when I did contracting work around Atlanta mm -hmm. and I learned a ton during that. Like, I feel, I feel like you could give me a drill and a foundation and I could build a house. Like if, if the concrete slab is already poured, I can do everything else. Yeah. Like, it's funny how sometimes you could learn more about architecture by not being in architecture. <laughs> and, yeah, dude you know, working as a contractor. I, I learned when I was working as the owner's rep, I learned, oh my God, when I was hiring architects to work for me, it was, it, it really helped me understand and get clarity about really kind of how the business of architecture worked. I'm a big believer in like the cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary type of stuff. You know, if you get too siloed, then you're going to be missing out on a lot of information. There's a lot of info out there. Yeah. I got my license to be an architect in Florida. Nice. <laughs> yeah. What the Is hell? there extra work you have to do for that? No. Is it the hurricanes? I just paid a bunch of fees and processed a bunch yeah, of paperwork okay. and waited. Yeah. I for it took a while. It took longer than I thought it would take, and I was worried. I was like, "Oh shit, there." <laughs> NCARB's not going to help me out because I'm Mike Rasika, but um, <laughs> it came. It came. <laughs> Don't have any friends over there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it happened. How so, long did it take? Uh, it took like, took like two months and I, I thought it was two only going to take like, like four to five weeks, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I got my reciprocity in New York. Oh, that's good. How long it took? I think it took a month or two. Um, yeah, I was surprised at how much the fees were. It was a lot, but like my really? office covered half of it. Yeah. It was like, a, I think it was like a thousand, maybe what? a little more. And I then think... the office covered half. That's a lot. I think I paid three, uh, I paid NCARB 300. What was it? NCARB? I paid, it was either 377 or 366. Yeah. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it. So it would have been about, about seven, 700 or 800. Yeah. I think I paid NCARB 300 and then it's uh, 
two, like two or three hundred bucks to the state. So. Yeah, I think it was like three. Between three fifty and four hundred was, was what I paid, and then the office matched it, and then that covered the whole the whole cost. Do you, you know, know what's in- funny? Oh, I got man. home from something, and I'd been walking home like a few nights in a row, and down in the down in the hall in the our mailboxes there was this thing down there. I said, "Do not bend." I was like, "Huh? What is that?" And I hear it's "Don't bend." <laughs> so I might have some important shit coming in coming in one of my neighbors, and then it was I think I was walking in on like a Friday night, and I open up the mailbox and I, there's nothing there. I close it and then it dings. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm waiting on my license. I turn around and I look at that, at that thing on the ground that says, do not bend. I might go, I'll pick it up and it's mine. And it's my life, it's my license in New York. And it sat there for like a few days before I realized that it was <laughs> my New York license. That's that funny. was framed and hanging over my. Yeah. There you, you know, go. <laughs> there you go. This is going to sound really nerdy, but me, I think now uh, once my paper, my, piece of paper comes i think me and my girlfriend are gonna get matching frames and have them framed together and That's just hang sweet. up in our apartment <laughs> <laughs> two florida nice. architects yeah <laughs> so does she have her florida license yeah nice. yes yeah, she got it about a a little less than a year ago how do you keep your stamps they're in a drawer um I don't know. It's just in a drawer. I'm sitting out on my desk right now, and I really want yeah. some kind of box for them. I've been Googling around. There's some at CB2, which is associated with Crate and Barrel. Okay. But they're a little bit more affordable. And I found some containers there that I want to get. But, like, also the idea has crossed my mind. Like, what if I designed a box that you could hold mm-hmm. stamps that looked legit? You should make, like, a concrete stamp box with a hinge on it that you could, you know, <laughs> open it up grab your stamp yeah cb2 has one that's pretty good it's got like a cementitious stone i think it's cement or i think it's cement um they got a good one i'm not exactly a woodworker and like i think if i spent a lot of time i could probably design something but i also think i got friends who like yeah build furniture i could be like hey you're gonna get your license soon this is going to be a problem for you not too long from now. How about you design one of these things? Let's work it out. I was, right now, mine are just chilling out on my desk. Juan, is Juan Alvarez part of your crew? Juan Alvarez. I know the name. I feel yeah. like I know him. But he's I'm having part of, he's one of the guys from Atlanta. From, I think he's friends with Christian Brazier. Um, he showed me some furniture he made recently. It's unfreaking believable. It's beautiful. <laughs> nice. That's like one skill I wish I had is woodworking. Maybe someday. Yeah, man. I'm you comfortable with a drill. I, I can I can screw some things together. Yeah. But um I would say my, my woodworking abilities are pretty are pretty crude. Yeah. I haven't I haven't done anything since an architecture school, but someday. I'm thinking about dropping, buying a house, Drew. Maybe I'll set up a little wood shop or something. Thinking about buying a house. You mentioned this briefly to me. Yeah. What's the plan? Where is it at? I don't know, probably in Florida somewhere. Um okay. okay. I'm not leaving Florida anytime soon. Um, it's you, crazy are you as, happy with Orlando? Oh, yeah. Orlando I love area? It. Yeah. Cool. As crazy as f- insane Florida is, um, I don't know. I really like it here. I mean, I, I grew up in New Jersey and New York area. It's just as weird. Um, but, yeah, I really, like, I really like it down here. And so, um, I don't know. I'm thinking about being an adult and probably early 2021 um, buying a place to live. I mean, I'm paying it. I don't know. I'm paying a fortune in my apartment here. It's really nice, but it's a it's a three bedroom, fifteen hundred square foot apartment with a pool. And um, I don't know. I uh, I'm getting closer to paying off all my student debt and my van and all that. So I'm thinking about yeah, maybe I buy a house. But I haven't made any moves yet. It's just I don't know. These are adult things that I've been kind of kicking around. How do you feel about the idea of buying a property where you could maybe turn it into a duplex, rent out to people? Yeah. You live in Orlando. There's tons of Airbnbs for people trying to go to. What I would probably do is build like a little uh, accessory dwelling unit off the back. I think that'd probably be more of a a reality. Um, 
regardless of what I get, there's going to be some kind of a major project that comes with it. It's just the nature of who I am. You know, I'm going to build something, you know, um, I don't know what that looks like yet, but yeah. So I've just been kind of kicking that around, starting to look at houses and stuff, but I see, I got to get, I got to get a feel. I got to, I got to research it more. I'm like a professional researcher. I like researching things and um, <laughs> comparing and learning and educating myself. But a lot of the stuff I've seen would be like, they want $400,000 for that piece of shit house. That's stupid. Like, so I'm just trying to get a feel for what things are worth. Mm -hmm. That's nice, man. That's good. That's a big step. Yeah. But so, so you are interested in turning it into kind of a investment where you have a rental property on the site somewhere? Well, yes and no. I mean, I run my business. It's part of a, that's, oh. that was part of the apartment deal as well. So this three bedroom apartment, it's not just me, my girlfriend, and the dogs. It's, me, my girlfriend, the dogs, and young architect who uh, who actually live here. So, right. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's part of it as well. But yeah, I've considered that. I like having the space. Before pandemic happened, you know, I was constantly having visitors. Even when I lived in Portland, I was I I like constantly. I would I don't think a month went by without having someone come and stay with me. Um, so it's just kind of the nature of who I am. So yeah, there, there'll probably be space for other people as well. Nice. Yeah, I've been real fired up about the idea of uh, property development, like real estate development, because I feel like I saw there was, there was a lecture at the AIA event, the AIA conference in, in New York, and I actually missed the live presentation because I think it was at like 7 a.m., so I did not go. But the, the, the YouTube videos online, and they're talking about architects as developers. Oh, yeah. And they have this neat little graphic where He's talking about okay, first is like property acquisition and then it's like design and then construction and then sale. And architects only get in, they get in after the first step, which is property acquisition. And then they get out before the end, which is the sales. Mm -hmm. And I'm forgetting something in the middle, but it's something like that. Point is that the first and the last stage, architects are not there. If we just stepped in a little earlier, we could cash out at the end where they're selling the property because we're pumping in all this work. You get the drawings done, all this, that, and the other, but we're not reaping the benefits of the developer. And I love the idea of, you know, architects running development. So I, I really want to get into that. I think the way you get in, it seems like you get in on the ground floor doing converting a single family house to a duplex or something like that. Yeah. I've been out here looking at Zillow, you know, for, for a little while trying to find, is there something I could afford? Can I make the move on something? And um, the numbers are tight for me. I, I haven't found any deal that makes sense yet. New York city is a tough market too, man. Yeah. I think New York is impossible. I've been looking in, yeah. in Atlanta actually. And I got a buddy who's getting an MBA. We were thinking about, like, he's going to be making a, a lot right out of college. But that was before COVID, so I don't know if that makes sense anymore. But he was talking; he he's interested in the same thing. But his background is MBA and business, not architecture at all. And so, you know, we're good friends. He was like, "Hey, maybe if you could pitch in, like, you know, X amount, I could find a few other people. X amount, we could buy a 16 unit rental building, apartment building." Sounds scary. I'm, to me. I'm, I'm captivated by the <laughs> idea of real estate development. It's been in the back of my head for a long time. I just I don't have the capital to move on it right now, so I'm still like lurking in the background, yeah, studying everything. But like I, I really want to make the move on that. There's a yeah. guy in Atlanta called John Portman, who is one of the most famous architects out of Atlanta. But he got a lot of shit from the AIA. I think he got kicked out of the AIA because he was an architect and a developer. And you know what they said? They said that's a conflict of interest that there's three parties involved. It's like a three legged stool, which first of all, I don't like the analogy yeah. of a stool. Like I understand yeah. what you're saying, but like, don't, don't call me a stool. <laughs> <We're> not, <laughs> you can come up with a more elegant analogy than that. Uh, it's, it's like, it's business design and construction. And when you are business and design, that's a conflict of interest. They weren't happy about that. Like they were mad he was winning so bad. He designed half the buildings on the skyline of Atlanta. Yeah. I don't know. It sounds like the sounds like the architecture industry to me. You know, people don't like it when other people win. But I don't know. I think it's kind of silly. If the guy has the money, he could be the developer, the architect, or the contractor. He, I think he also ended up being 
a contractor company as well, by the way. So he basically just ran his own. He was like his one man wrecking crew. I'm going to show you a building he did. Let's see it. This is the Marriott Marquis in Atlanta. This Dude, I remember when, when you were there, you were in uh, at that fraternity, weren't you? Having Yeah. You made a YouTube video or made a uh, an Instagram story there or something. This is John Borman. He was all about some atriums. I think yeah. this one's the this one I think it's the Hyatt, which is a block or two away. And I think this was in some movie. The Hunger Games. I think that I, I didn't see the Hunger Games, but I heard about it. And I think that it was a, something bad in the scene happened. But anyway. Um, yeah, wow. These are some of the exteriors. Let's see. Oh, wait. Hold up. This. I think that's in Detroit. That's not a good photo, though. Yeah. Um, Portman. Skyline. Yeah. Atlanta. I want to spend more time in Atlanta. It's a cool city. He designed this building, that building, that building. There's four buildings back there that look like that. He designed this one here with the with the saucer on top. Did it? That's all. And I know. I think he designed this one over here too. This brutalist thing, but I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Isn't the Gensler office where I did that lecture in one of those towers? All four of these. Um, yes. Hold up. Where were we at? Oh, wait. No. No. Um. Is that it on the right, the black one? That was a cool that office. That's up in Buckhead. That's not, that's not the no. one. They had a nice view. This is it. 999 Peach Street. Oh, yeah. There it is. That's right. Yeah. Parked in that parking garage. Yeah. I think this is a, I think this is a relative, I think this is a handsome building. Yeah, um, not, not the best, not the worst. Yeah. Let's see Wikipedia, who is the architect? You miss Atlanta? I think it was Picard Chilton. True, do you miss being in Atlanta? Heary, Heary Architect and Engineers. George works there, or he did. Um, uh, do I miss Atlanta? I do miss Atlanta, but I miss it enough to go back for a vacation. I don't, I, I don't miss it enough to move back. Yeah. I'm super happy with, with New York. I mean, the pandemic sucks and it's kind of throwing a monkey wrench into everything, but, um, I still think I'm having more fun here than I would have in Atlanta. Even if you have more space, it's yeah. like... Yeah, you got more space. What are you going to go do? I yeah. mean, out here we got all these, everybody's eating outdoors now. Yeah. And New York's exciting, man. I mean, yeah. I grew up there. I've been going to New York since I was a kid. But I mean, if you've never lived in New York City, it's freaking, there's so much to explore in different neighborhoods and places and things to go, things to do. I love Atlanta. It's got a lot of stuff going for it, man. Like there's, a, I, I haven't been everywhere. So this is probably a naive statement to say. But I feel like there's only a few other places I would rather live. I mean, let's say there's only a few other places I would live if New York was unavailable. And I mean, that would be, Atlanta would be one of them. Atlanta's a real city. And yeah. I always forget that every time I go <laughs> and get reminded like, oh shit, this is a real city. Whereas like, like Orlando and Portland, Oregon, even Seattle, like Seattle's more of a real city than Portland is, but um i feel like a lot of other places i was a little surprised at how small portland was portland was cool but it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the metropolis because i guess atlanta yeah. was kind of my litmus test mm -hmm. i assume every city that's not atlanta excuse me every city that's not new york chicago la miami i don't know i just figured that like okay they must be one tier lower in terms of density size whatever i thought that was like atlanta yeah. level but then after seeing Portland, I realized, oh, maybe Atlanta is bigger than somewhere like Portland. And well, Portland's kind of like the New York City suburbs in a way, too. I mean, it's, there's parts of Long Island. It's a good way of it. It reminds me of Long Island in a way, you know, with all the different little neighborhoods yeah, yeah. and things happening. But that's a good way of putting it. I hadn't thought about it like that. But I think you're right. Do you miss Portland? No, I don't. I miss my friends. 
I, there was a lot of good people there, man. And Same there was, with Atlanta. That was why I stayed there for as long as I did. Um, the, everything I loved about Portland, everything I fell in love with Portland for the 10 years I lived there, by the time, um, by the time I left, it was all gone. It was not, it was a different Portland. Um, I had changed. What do you mean by that? Um, it was all these cute, well, it, you know, what ended up happening was California decided to, to, to move California to Portland and it, um, they drove up all the housing costs, uh, Airbnb, you know, the cost of living got very expensive. Um, the mayor, we had a, a Portland had a series of, of really wimpy, you know, little mayors and, um, the last mayor just got got bullied by the homeless people by the homeless uh ad advocacy groups and everything and he essentially legalized uh camping on the streets of portland so all of a sudden literally overnight boom there was tents on the sidewalks in front of my very expensive apartment building and um the homeless situation just got out of control and uh within about a there period a lot of homeless yeah within a period of about three years um I went from seeing every time I walk my dog in the morning and at night, I would see, I would see bad stuff, man. I would see a lots of, lots of needles, lots of people shooting up, you know, prostitution, teenage prostitution, just, just gnarly stuff. And it took its toll on me. And it was shortly after Trump got elected and people, you know, in Portland is a, is a very activist city. So there was the riot, there were riots after Trump got elected. And there was a bad snowstorm and Portland is not prepared for a snowstorm at all. No one owns a shovel. Um, and so it just, I went on a business trip and uh, to the East coast and the whole time I was gone, I was like, the sun was out and I was just, I was just really happy. And the minute I got back to Portland, I was miserable again. And I was like, I think it's time to go. I think I got a, it's been 10 years. I've been here 10 years you know, young architect was thriving on the East Coast. People are constantly like, Mike, can you come and speak and do this? And, you know, meanwhile, here I am, like, in the most remote part of the country out in Portland, Oregon. And, like, I don't know, like, my audience was not in Portland, Oregon. It was all on the East Coast. And so I was just like, I felt like, you know, I had gotten really far in my career. I had grown young architect. It was my full-time job at that point. But I felt like if I was going to take things to the next level, I had to, um, it was kind of, I needed to kind of make a move. And so I got rid of my apartment and came back to the East Coast. Do you think that Portland helped you incubate and start Young Architect? Absolutely. Or do you think you could have done it anywhere else just as easy? Mm, I probably would have did it somewhere else. Um, but it did help at the time. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I was in a good situation. And I, I rocked that situation and made it work for me. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it would have looked like if I was somewhere else. But it's funny how cities get those different attitudes, you know, like people always say that about New York. They have an attitude about New York. They say that New York's got this like, oh, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. It's all these yeah. tough people or whatever. And, um, you know, I think that's debatable. I think it depends. I think you can find whatever it is you're looking for. But the general marketing of a city is something that's always been interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Atlanta is one that I think has an interesting marketing, at least. Um, it's kind of this attitude of like, it's, it's the biggest city in the Southeast. We talk, yeah. you go, you go to a Braves game and they talk about Braves country, everything like there's no baseball team in Alabama. There's no baseball team in Mississippi or South Carolina or North Carolina. I don't think Tennessee has got the Memphis Tigers, but like everybody pulls the Atlanta Braves. Same thing happens economically. Everybody pulls to Atlanta. Very few people in Atlanta are from Atlanta. Yeah. Almost everyone came there from somewhere else. And so it's got this weird dynamic quality to it. And it's like, it's also like, it's got the civil rights history to it. It's got like, it's like the rap hip hop center of the, of the world. And it's, it's hard to tell how much that stuff actually mixes mm -hmm. or is how segregated or desegregated it actually is. But, but the, they, they have this, they say, have a saying that Atlanta is the city too busy to hate. And, you know, I kind of, I like that a lot. You know, I, I, I like the idea that, you know, this is kind of where it's, it's the crossroads between a lot of different cultures in a sense, not in the way New York is, it's different, but um, 
it's also got the Southern flavor to it. So it's not like super fast moving, like New York has the marketing of being super fast moving. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of things I like about it. I'm not sure what, what spurs it on. I think that the mayor of, of Portland is very influential. That only because I've heard about it a lot lately, even with, oh, yeah. with the riots and stuff that have been going mayor, on. It's but, yeah. funny as we've heard the mayor of Atlanta coming on yeah. as well. Um, she seems cool to me. I don't know. That, she's that, that black woman, right? Yeah. Keisha Lance Bottoms. Yeah, she seems cool. <laughs> she seems pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't miss Portland at all. I see everything that's happening in the news, and it just, I felt like the day to day just took its toll on me. Um, I saw more gnarly shit on a daily basis than I've seen since I've left, left um, Portland. And um, yeah, I just don't want to be around people shooting up all the time and you know, junkies everywhere and prost like, I'd like, that's not like, I was spending a lot of money to live there and it's just not the, my reality. And so I was just like, I don't know. It was kind of time for me to make a move. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I know what you mean. I saw some of that when I was there with the, uh, the young architect conference. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there were those little pockets. You'd walk past them. I in felt like ways, in it, within Atlanta, but, I'd cross some pockets like that too, but it wasn't, it didn't seem quite as prevalent yeah. in Atlanta as, as Portland. In retrospect, I, I had no idea at the time, but I kind of regret doing the Young Arctic Conference in Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, I went out to Portland, Oregon two months, or, you know, I, the conference was the end of, is in July. I got there early June. No, I got there mi uh, middle of June. And so I spent a month and a half in Portland, Oregon, kind of hustling, trying to get people to buy tickets and come to my conference. And no one bought a freaking ticket. Uh, I, that, I didn't want to bring that up, but yeah. yeah, when you were talking about your audience all being over on the East Coast, oh, yeah. I, I thought of, I remember you telling me that you ran around trying to get everybody in Portland to show up and then they were, they didn't. Yeah, I, so I you, met with all these firms. I offered them discounts. I said, you know, and it was like, Mike, maybe next year, you know. And, and yet there's people who are willing to fly all the way across the yeah. country, <laughs> but the people in Portland won't walk down the street. I had more people from New York city show up than I had the people that this, this event was right in their backyards. So, um, yeah. And then, um, I don't know. And then it's kind of, yeah, it, but I didn't know. I mean, it was, it was an amazing event. Um, I had no other options. Yeah. yeah. Well, well I think it was a refreshing, I think it was a refreshing take to be in, to be in Portland. Yeah. Everyone wants to see it, Portland and visit and kind of, I think it's a big part of it too, is traveling, you know, going to a conference and getting outside your, you know, I think when it's, when it's right in your backyard, people take it for, you know, for granted. So, all right, guys, me and Drew have just been rambling for, I don't know how long, hour, hour and a half. Um, I think we're going to wrap up this episode and we're going to record some more. Drew, want to record another episode next week? Yes, for sure. A and Drew, to talk about this on the podcast we got to record we got to release this son of a bitch uh we've yeah, got we like five or six episodes i don't know how many destiny's been editing it and polishing it up and so now that summer series is over let's get this thing out the door um and let's start sharing this this podcast with the public absolutely um, i'm excited so, about it so let's talk about that let me um yeah we'll talk about it next week but hopefully yeah, i think we should release it in like the next week or two and, yes uh, get this out the door so Sweet. All right, team. Thanks for hanging with us. It was great chatting. It was cool hanging out with Drew, getting caught up. Yeah, man. Same here. It's been a lot of fun. I'll hope this provided a lot of value. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hope it helps. See you next week, man. All right. See ya. Adios.